In Matthew 12, 1 through 8, we have a discussion of the Sabbath or the Shabbat. In this passage, the disciples are going through the field and plucking grain on Shabbat in order to eat it. And when they do this, the Pharisees point out to Jesus and tell him that the disciples are violating the command. What I find most interesting about his response is that he doesn't make the case that it's not a violation. He doesn't say, you're wrong, or I have a different interpretation of the Shabbat command, or you're just going off of the traditions rather than the real commands. He doesn't make any of those arguments. The argument he makes actually implies that he believes that they are violating the Shabbat commands. He actually seems to accept that. So instead of saying that it's not a violation, he responds by giving an example of someone else violating a command. The argument is, is that there is a precedent of other people violating commands and not being held accountable. Therefore, it's okay that they are doing it. He concludes the passage by saying that they essentially have the authority to violate commands, or at least they are supposedly allowed to do things which the normal person isn't allowed to do. That's the aspect of the passage that I'm going to focus on. A person may think that what they're doing with the plucking the grain should or shouldn't be allowed by the standard of the Torah, but that will largely be irrelevant to my point. The most striking element of this to me is that he is implicitly accepting that it is a violation of the law. Now, one thing some people might get temporarily stuck on in this passage is the content of the two examples which are given. The two examples given are David and the, the showbread or the bread of the presence and the activities of the priest in the temple. For me, I do not have the assumption that, that everything which went on in the Hebrew Bible was automatically according to the commands. That even if the person was a patriarch or other notable figure, in my view there's no getting around, around the fact that many of the stories in the text involve people violating commands. The fact that the story says David violated a command and may have gotten away with it does not make it right. Citing that story as a precedent for violating commands that comparison strikes me as, as troubling more than anything. The other example, the one regarding the priests supposedly profaning the Shabbat, that's not in any way similar to the actual incident in question, nor to the previous example. If one wants to discuss whether the priests are violating the law by doing what they are commanded to do in the law, that's a completely separate matter. The priests were commanded in the law to do things in the tabernacle on that day. But David was not commanded in the law to eat the showbread, and the disciples were not commanded in the law to pluck grain. It's not a reasonable example in my view. So considering the fact that these examples are being cited as arguments, especially the David example, the implications are rather unsettling. The question that some might be asking is whether the, the Shem Tov version resolves anything since the Greek version is so troubling, and the answer is that it does not. The same problems are in it as in the Greek version. Obviously, one belief is that he supposedly has the authority to do this, so it's not a problem, that he has the ability to do what he wants and not actually have fault placed upon him even if the thing which he does is sin. Also, the view might be that he has the ability to change the law, something which would be sin by Deuteronomy 4, 2, and 12, 32. A question I would have is, when and how am I supposed to realize that the law doesn't apply to him? If I'm trying to seek after God, after Elohim, and seek to do what he commanded, and I come across a man that says he has the authority to go outside the law, where in the law am I going to find that? On what basis am I going to say that this is somehow not a problem? If I was walking down the street today and ran into a man or a woman that was preaching on the corner and someone pointed out that she had been sinning and her response was that it didn't matter because of who she is, I'm automatically going to view that as a problem. At what point am I going to decide that it's okay for this person to do that? 
And one might say that signs and wonders and miracles should be proof that the person is authorized to change the law, therefore violating the law. But if you look at Deuteronomy 13, it says that there may be people who are illegitimate who are accompanied by signs and wonders. On top of that, what can we make of the whole idea that he supposedly lived under the law and did it perfectly? Those two ideas do not fit together, so which one am I supposed to recognize? Did he follow the law perfectly in full and do everything that was required of people? Or was it that he didn't follow the entire written law because of who he was, which gave him the ability to change the law and not have to follow the law? Those two beliefs being held simultaneously if a person brings both of those beliefs to the forefront of their mind, the idea that he lived under the law and lived without sin and followed it perfectly, and that he and his disciples have the authority to sin because of who he is, it's clear that, that at least one of these beliefs will have to change. I invite you to refer back to that verse to see that he is saying that he doesn't believe the law applies to him. While there are passages elsewhere in the Gospels that speak more favorably of the law, or suggest following the law, saying something favorable about the law elsewhere does not give one a free pass to do or say the other things. And these passages, the ones that go against the law, still exist. If we believe the law is important, and we believe a Messiah needs to uphold the law, then this would strike me as troubling. With regard to this issue of the Lord of the Sabbath, and with regard to him saying he is faultless, despite implicitly accepting that what they are doing is a violation of the Shabbat, I think it's clear that the passage does not uphold the Torah. These are the passages that I wanted to address. Even though there are verses about him not abolishing the law and such, I think that we should also be considering these other passages at the same time. We may see some, some general statements in Matthew that are positive toward the law, but we also have to consider what a person says and does otherwise. The concept that he followed the Torah perfectly, that he taught the Torah perfectly, does not hold in that light because he openly admits that not everything he is doing is according to the law, such as with the Shabbat passage. And he openly admits that not everything he is teaching is according to the law, such as with the divorce passage. As we go forward in the days and weeks to come, and as we continue our seeking and our pursuits of truth, I suggest that we recall those admissions as we consider where to go from here.